And I want to return now to Paul Keating and that astonishing performance today in the National Press Club. Always a critic of AUKUS and a man unabashed in talking up and defending China. Even for Keating, this was vintage vitriol, going after his own side, including the PM, and bullying and attacking journalists along the way. I'm pleased to say, joining me now, someone who isn't unfamiliar with being on the other side of one of the Keating sprays, but always happy to return fire, Greg Sheridan, foreign editor at The Australian. You're in the studio with me. Um, we were just talking before we came on air, I tell my viewers. That's vintage, that's vintage Keating, but it's perhaps done him no good service today. Yeah, I think that's right, Peter. I think Keating is now a very sad figure. He's sad, bitter, isolated, irrelevant and unhappy. Um, Keating, I think, is attacking Albanese not from the left or the right, but from the past. But he's not attacking him from the 1990s and the 1980s when he and Hawke ran a good government. He's attacking Albanese from the 1970s. This is 1970s Labor culture, this hatred of America, this silly chip on the shoulder, contempt for Britain, dripping sarcasm about India, of course, mm. and, as usual, replete with lots and lots of factual errors. I mean, uh, Keating... You know, there's one wonderful moment where he says he bullied Penny Wong into not launching Peter Harch's book or endorsing it on the back cover. Turns out Penny Wong did launch the book and did endorse it on the back cover. Now, if he is so unreliable on a matter of fact in an incident that happened sort of five minutes ago, what, what's he like on the big questions of history? I would say just completely uh, off the planet. I think I might have a, a grab there. Uh, Olivia Causley from, from Sky News put him under some pressure to say, look... These views are all good and well, but uh, you haven't been in office for nearly 30 years. You wouldn't have had the most current sort of military and security briefings. Let's have a listen. What makes you so sure China isn't a military threat to Australia? Because I've got a brain, principally, and I can think and I can read. Why would China want a threat? What would be the point? They get the iron ore, the coal, the wheat. What, what would be the point of China wanting to occupy Sydney and Melbourne? I know you're trying to ask a question, but the question is so dumb it's hardly worth an answer. China has committed in the eyes of the United States the great sin of internationalism, and that's what China presents. China's mere presence, I mean, they would have preferred they remain in poverty, 20% of humanity forever. I'll get your response, Craig, on his commentary today about China. Well, and of course, let's note straight off how rude he was to that journalist who asked a perfectly legitimate question. It was, was not even an aggressive or rude question. And, and his supporters, you know, the acolytes who still cheer him on and think he's so wonderful, they really think this is a, the way a statesman behaves. But everything, almost everything he says about China is completely wrong. So he said in that grab, the United States would have preferred if China had remained in abject poverty, 20%. Mm -hmm. That is just barking mad. China was brought into the global economy as an act of considered United States national policy. Nixon and Kissinger first drew China into the international system. The United States midwifed China's entry into the World Trade Organization. Bill Clinton thought very seriously about whether China's human rights abuses even then mm. were so severe that he should not give China most favoured nation trade status, but he went ahead and gave China most favoured nation trade status. The Americans could easily have vetoed China joining APEC or any of these other institutions. For many years, the US ran a $200 billion a year trade deficit with China. That's an enormous inje injection of wealth mm -hmm. into China. American companies invested. There were scholarships for Chinese students. Yet Keating says, as though everyone knows it, that the Americans would have preferred the Chinese to stay in abject poverty. So I, I would just say, why would any sensible person pay attention to this inane nonsense, which is just bears no relation to reality? It's just on planet planet uh, Zog. And his acolytes in the media, I'd ask them, is that what you think is, is a significant contribution? I think today he was so crazy and so unreasonable mm. that the, the little bit of residual influence he has, he will have just about wiped it out by today. Yeah, yeah but you and I both know that there is a quite a significant contingent in the parliament on the Labor side who still hold him in some air of reverence. 
And uh, people like Chris Bowen, when he's done those long form interviews, has said how he, he basically picks up the phone constantly to Keating. He uh, picks his brain about economic issues and more. So uh, he referenced today actually too that, you know, he, he spoke to uh, the now Prime Minister of Kirribilli House before he went to the G20. Uh, this is, of course, uh, doled up a little bit by Keating. There's a bit of an embellishment there. But, you know, clearly he has the ear of senior Labor people. I don't know that he will tomorrow as much as he did after today, but um, that's the concern. How much influence does he wield inside the party, but inside the Cabinet? Very little, I think. So the Labor Party, you know, is a little bit better than Liberals at making legends and heroes of their former leaders. And if yeah. they possibly can, they continue to honour their former leaders. But what Keating did today was declare war on the Albanese government. He spoke about Albanese and Richard Miles and Penny Wong in contemptuous and contemptible terms. He has declared war on the Albanese Labor government. A few weeks back, I wrote a, a column in which I said Keating is becoming Albanese's chief enemy. Mm -hmm. And Keating was, you know, in his usual uproar about it and wrote a sort of scathing, abusive response. He merely described me as vacuous and spiteful, whereas Peter Harcher, he describes as the most egregious journalist in 50 years. I'm a bit jealous. But um, today, Keating declared war on the Labor government. I don't think it's open any longer to Chris Bowen or Andrew Charlton or any of the Labor people. Mm -hmm. Now, and of course, in their defence, in their partial defence, if they are looking on the inspiration of Keating as a treasurer mm -hmm. or even as a prime minister, then yes, there, there's a lot there. You know, I wish this government was more like the Hawke-Keating government, you know. But Keating today himself is nothing like what he was as Prime no, Minister. No, that's very true. Well, I look forward to the next column. Greg <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Peter.